Hello and welcome to the Frontington and Backwards Railway. Today I'm installing signals. In my previous video I was making the hill that separates Frontington Station from Backwards Halt. There's a link in the corner if you want to see how I did that. And with the hill in place I decided the wooden baseboard really needed a coat of brown paint too. Eventually that'll all be covered over with something more convincing, but in the meantime it would be nice not to see the wood grain in all my photos. So a coat of brown acrylic did the job nicely. But what I'd really like is to lay some ballast along the tracks, and give the goods yard a more fitting surface. But before I do that, there are a few bits of infrastructure I'll need to sort out. Firstly, I need to weather the track. Now, I don't have a fancy airbrush, but I do have a paintbrush, and that'll do just fine. This is just brown acrylic paint, and gives the sides of the rails a lovely rusty colour. I'll also give the sleepers a coat of slightly darker brown, which helps to stop them look quite so plastic. Keen-eyed viewers will notice an anomaly in the matrix here though, because the baseboard isn't painted yet in these shots. Such things we must put up with for good storytelling. Next, the signalman will need a walkway from the signal box to the platform, because health and safety did actually exist back in the 1930s, believe it or not. I've started things off by gluing these support structures in place. They're actually leftover sleepers. I'll then be able to ballast around those supports, before then putting the wooden walkway on top of that. But that's a topic for a future video, because I haven't done it yet. The other important thing I need to sort out, and which is the main subject of this video, is some signals. So naturally, the first thing I did was cut some metal. This is aluminium U-channel, which I'm cutting with a junior hacksaw. It makes a fantastic mount for a servo, which is what I'll be using to move the signals and points. It might need a little careful adjustment to make sure it's good and snug. That then gets mounted underneath the layout, in more or less the right place. I attached mine with superglue, but I'm sure you'd have just as much success with screws, or double-sided tape, or hopes and dreams, you know, whatever you have rattling around in your drawers. We'll also need some wire. Oh, and here's a quick tip for straightening wire. Just pull it firmly between two bits of wood, and the kinks just sort of drop out. Fitting it to the servo is a bit fiddly, and I'll have to come back and adjust that later anyway. Next we come to the signals themselves. Now, I'm going to use these ratio kits I built for the previous iteration of this layout. I had thought about using the Daypole signals, which are motorised and have lights in them, but that seemed like overkill, when I can get most of the way there pretty cheaply. So I removed the original wire, and threaded the new wire in place, which was pretty much as easy as it looks. Once everything is in the right place, a spot of superglue holds the signal in place. Next I'll need a way of controlling those servos, and the servos I'll eventually install for the points in a similar way. So I made up a switch panel. 
I had a scrap of 6mm hardboard lying around, which happens to be exactly the sort of wood I need. It's just about thin enough for my switches, so I marked and drilled out a load of holes. The first attempts were a little messy, but I found if I clamped the wood to another piece of scrap wood underneath, the exit wound was much cleaner. quite what I had in mind. This wood has split. Clearly couldn't take that number of holes. Fortunately I have a good relationship with my local wood fairy, so a new piece magically appeared. It's slightly thinner, slightly more dense, and has exactly the right number of holes that I need. So next I glued on some sides. And that looks perfect. Ah, I've just heard from the wood fairy again. Seems I had that piece of wood upside down. Oh, yes, fair enough, the laminated side looks much nicer. And with it all clamped again, I left it to dry overnight. The next step was to fit the switches. These are single pole, single throw. Just simple on-off switches that I bought online. And they went into the holes nicely. And I've numbered the holes underneath so that I know what's what, using my lever diagram as a reference. Hmm, looks like there's one too many holes here. Ah oh well, better that than one too few, I suppose. Not sure my favour with the wood fairy would hold out if I asked for another switch panel. My plan with this switch panel is to use an Arduino Nano to control my servos. There are plenty of videos online showing how you can connect a servo directly to an Arduino Nano and control it, so I figured I could easily control several with the same method. I bought this expansion board, which looks like it's perfectly designed for connecting loads of servos to an Arduino Nano. I don't have enough inputs on a Nano for all the switches and servos, so the plan is to have two Arduinos, one for the points and one for the signals. Now, remember those videos I mentioned that show how easy it is to operate a servo connected directly to an Arduino? Well, of course you do, I literally just told you about them. What they usually neglect to mention is that that's only good enough for a demonstration. It isn't actually what you're meant to do. The Arduino just doesn't have enough oomph to power more than one servo at a time, and probably not under any load. And that expansion board I bought? That's not actually intended to drive servos, it just looks like it. So after I bought all the components, I realised my error and had to rethink. That's when I found this. It's a PCA9685 16 channel servo driver board. It uses 5 volts from the Arduino just to power its logic chip two inputs from the Arduino to transfer data, and takes a second power source for running the servos. Now we're talking. With just one Arduino Nano, and two power sources, I can control 16 servos, which is more than enough for this layout right now. So I drilled some new holes to mount the servo driver. I also had this expansion board from a previous project, which should be useful. 
you plug the Arduino Nano into the socket, and then all the legs have screw terminal blocks, which is much neater. So I screwed both boards directly to the underside of the switch panel. Now, technically, I should probably have used proper PCB standoffs, but as long as the boards aren't being bent, it's, it's absolutely fine. And the wood is non-conductive, so it, it doesn't pose a problem. Next comes the wiring. In a moment of complete genius and careful planning, the wires connecting to the servo driver board can be routed tidily underneath the Arduino. We've got ground, 5 volt power, and the two data connections that go into A4 and A5. And finally, the Arduino slots on top. Beautiful. Connecting the switches was pretty straightforward too. All the negatives are soldered to a piece of wire and connected to ground. And then there's a positive feed that connects to the digital I.O. pins to tell the Arduino what I want to do. After a bit of playing around and bug fixing, here's the code I ended up with. Now I know coding isn't everyone's cup of tea, but I happen to really like tea. And code. But I'll keep this explanation as brief as I can. First off, if you've done any programming with an Arduino before, you'll recognise the setup function, which does all the setting up. In particular, we're creating an array of servo objects, telling each one things like which pin the servo is attached to, which pin the button is on, the range of the servo, how quickly it should move, you know, that, that kind of thing. Then in the loop function, we go through each of those servo objects and update it, again and again, in a loop. But hang on, I hear you shouting at your screen. What is that magical servo object anyway? Well, that's defined up here. This is a custom class I've written to encapsulate all the servo and button related stuff. It's just a neat way of making sure that the code is easily reusable without too much copying and pasting. We've got a constructor method here, which takes all of that information we gave it down in the setup function, and stores it all inside the object ready to be used. Then in the update method, which is what gets called each time we go through the loop, we check the position of the associated button, or switch in my case, compare it against the current stored position of the servo, and either increase or decrease it by a certain amount and the bigger the value of delta is, the faster the servo will move, and vice versa. Now if you're not into coding, just accept that it's magic and move on. Now it's time for a quick test. So I plugged a servo into the first slot on the driver board and powered it all on. And here it is with four servos attached to it, all with different settings just to prove it really can handle more than one at a time. The switch panel is now screwed onto the base, so I can glue the lever diagram behind it. The idea here is to mimic what the signalman would see in the signal box. There are some levers that don't actually exist, for example for facing point locks and ground signals, which is why there are more holes than servos. Eventually I'll fill in the gaps with dummy switches so I can play signalman more convincingly. It's finally time to test the signals. 
In fairness, this isn't actually the first try. There was a fair bit of tinkering off camera to get the wire connected to the servo nicely, setting the range of the servo, and generally fixing bugs in my code. But I'm pretty pleased with the result. And to be honest, I was going to finish the video there. But something was bothering me. Something was missing. It doesn't bounce. In the real world, the signals would be controlled by a lever in the signal box, connected with flexible cables, and the signal arm itself would be weighted so that it wants to be either up or down but not really in the middle, and there would be a fair amount of slack in the system. So in real life, when the signalman changes the signal's position, it should bounce a little as it reaches the limit of the arm's travel. So I went back to the code and integrated a third-party library called Easing, which takes an input value and outputs a value that represents a position on a predefined curve. And there are lots of easing patterns available, including sine waves, exponential increments, elastic wobbles, and bounce. So instead of incrementing the servo position directly, which is what gave me the linear progression I started with, I can now apply a nice bounce to the servo's position, which is much more satisfying. I'll need to do the same for a double bracket signal at the end of the board, and I'll need to install some servos for the points too, so watch out for a follow-up video on that. I do post small updates and photos on my Facebook page, so check that out if you want a sneaky preview of what I'm working on. I've also put some links down below to some of the kit I've used in this project. They're not affiliate links, I'm not sponsored, I just thought I'd share the details with you. You can also like and subscribe, of course, and leave me a lovely comment, that's a great encouragement to me. But that's all for this video. Bye for now!